Hello and welcome to What The Lux with me, Fred Moore. And me, Anand Sharma. Together we lead Match Reform, brand and experience design consultancy headquarters in London. And this is a podcast that calls time on tired ideas of luxury. And alongside industry luminaries and thought leaders, we explore what truly defines category leading products and experiences. We're delighted today to have Chris Sanderson on our podcast. Chris is the co-founder of the Future Laboratory, a trends consumer intelligence and strategic foresight company. When he's not traveling the world delivering keynotes to organizations large and small, including a great speech at the Warpole earlier this week, he's working with brands to figure out what's next, a proposition close to our own. The world is moving faster than ever, and it's important to have a strong sense of the trends that will materially impact business. In my mind, that's become critical, especially as we lived in a world of hype and gimmick, and it's harder to sift through the noise and work out what matters and what doesn't. Chris, I'm so looking forward to hearing your perspective on change and what it means for business. Before we start, I just want to mention that I actually used to live on Orsman Road, which I noticed is where your new office is, one of my favourite parts of East London. It is great, isn't it? We call it the Haggerston Riviera. So we're on the canal in a great space, actually. I never thought I'd uh, find myself this far out of the centre of town, he says, having moved from Spitalfields. But uh, no, it's great. It's really good to be in a, a neighbourhood once again, where there are No chain stores, no chain coffee shops, no chain F&B outlets where there really is a sense of originality and independence going on. Couldn't agree with you more. It's it's, it's a delight being in the area every day. Chris, can you tell us a bit about your background and your journey into the fascinating world of insight and forecasting? Yeah, sure, Anand. It's been a, a slightly peripatetic career to some extent. But there's always been a couple of key things, I think, that have both always kept me focused and also been, as it were, the red thread, I suppose, through both a life and a career. Uh, Or the key one, I think, is actually curiosity. And in fact, my co-founder and I, Martin Raymond, decided to adopt the catch cry of the 18th century re-enlightenment, sapere aude, as our company motto. And, and, And for me, curiosity, I think, sits at the heart of everything that keeps me motivated and inspired. And I trained as an actor, and that, I think, is very much about a desire to know more about the human condition and about why people behave in certain ways. And I then moved from that into theatrical direction, which was, again, I think even more focused around this idea of understanding not just what makes individuals tick, uh, what drives a purpose, but then how you drive engagement. Because obviously, as a theatre director, you're looking at how you bring a whole bunch of people on a journey, whereas I think an actor is often very much internally focused on just a centralised, a kind of very internal perspective on Uh, on on bringing a dramatist's words to life and their impact on the internal individual. But I moved very quickly out of theatre because I found that actually I I found it quite confining and I started to move more into this kind of newly developing area of kind of creative direction where it wasn't tied into one particular medium or platform. But through that, I ended up uh, working more and more in, in fashion Uh, which at that time in the early 90s was a tremendously exciting time to work in fashion because, of course, um, we were seeing the breakdown of the traditional structures that had defined uh, haute couture. Uh, There was the emergence of uh, this notion of the designer element of fashion. It was, of course, the beginning from the mid-80s onwards of the journey of this notion of the designer catwalk and then of these large conglomerates that started to take a foothold although some might say a stranglehold, we can discuss that later, into this idea of um, luxury. But of course, it was also that period. And I'm thinking back into those early days in the 90s, where we saw Prada move into the catwalk show with their first collections in New York, where streetwear, where grunge really started to shift both public perception as well as industry perception around Uh, the role of fashion, the role of luxury, the role of the designer and the moments that we created around those. And and so that very much was the springboard for my own personal career into looking into the future. That's completely not the answer I expected. So so you went from theatre to theatrical direction to creative direction into the world of fashion as fashion became more of a business. Completely. And and uh, I think, you know, for me, I suppose to being trained as an actor, there's, there's an element always of, of thinking about communication. And I spent a while while I was a creative director as a writer. So I was contributing style editor for British Esquire. And, and from that, I then got a job as a, as a creative director for a, a fantastic magazine called Viewpoint, uh, which is a biannual publication 
that that looks at the future and it looks at creating the design and marketing strategies for the consumer of tomorrow. And uh, serendipitously, both myself and my future laboratory co-founder, Martin Raymond, were both offered jobs at this publication totally independently and without no- without knowing from the same magazine, from different departments. So he was invited to take over as the part-time editor. It was, it was only twice a year, so it was a part-time job. And I was asked to join the creative team. And we both came back because we, we're also life partners. And we, we came back and said, oh, I've had a really interesting meeting today and a really great offer. And we talked about the fact that we had both been offered this position or these positions on this magazine, which we both took. And we started work on it. And very soon after starting we realized that there was a massive potential with this particular magazine but it wasn't quite fulfilling its potential so we went to the publisher with some ideas which he was really really open about listening to and and we we redesigned the title we re-looked at its content and within six months we had people coming up to us and saying we love what you've done with viewpoint with the magazine we really want to find a consultancy that has the same ethos and the same principles and the same kind of thinking and the same kind of execution can you recommend someone and of course we couldn't because there wasn't anyone that was doing quite what we were doing so we very quickly realized that there was an opportunity to take what we were doing in print it was still good old-fashioned print then in terms of a, a creative and written understanding of what the future might look like and to actually develop that as as a platform for for businesses and for brands to start to think about how they could make their better future happen. I've got so many questions to ask about that, but I just want to clarify one thing first. You and your life partner both interviewed simultaneously for the same magazine. Yeah, correct. So we, we've been together since the early 90s, and it was in the mid to late 90s that we were both independently uh, approached by the by the same magazine to, to, to work with them to, to look at uh, the opportunities there. So yeah, that was... A one weird moment of serendipity that that just I suppose changed that the, to some extent the course of our lives uh, at that point because up until that point we had never worked really together our careers had always been really quite separate and so it, it was the beginning of a of a of a new way of thinking about living and working together. I'm interested in your background in theatre because I, I've always held this belief in in today's economy it's more useful to have a degree in drama than it is to have one in business. How you communicate points with clarity and how you create. You know, a compelling narrative that takes people and take people on a journey, convince them, moves them from one place to another. I think that's unbelievably important. And I think, especially in England, where we're perhaps a bit more inhibited in America, which is so ruthlessly commercial, people are perhaps a little bit more open. I feel that sometimes people really struggle to do that, present you know, ideas in in a way that's confident and and you know moves people you know, has drama to it. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, look, here we are where we've got. Thousands of people making a living out of exhorting the importance of storytelling, um, and we, you know, we talk about the the customer journey, the narrative all the time when you're in, in branding and when you're in retail. Everyone is, of course, talking about experience right now, and we understand that that's a, a four dimensional thing. And we talk about four D design all the time. The the idea that we add the, a period of time, a process of time. So you know, to grow up in an environment where you're Yes, you're you're learning how to project yourself. You're learning how to project your ideas, how to successfully communicate, to make them land, how to string a story together uh, in a compelling way, um, and how to weave elements into that. And and most of all, I think critically important, especially when we come to to talk about not a luxury, how you understand magic and how you understand the control you can have over somebody else's emotions, how you can actually make them feel something and to have come away from an engagement and to have really sincerely felt something, uh, you know, lies at the heart of all great engagements. But the paradigm of value, you know, is is, is built over a period of time. We talk a matter of form about C- CX or customer experience being the choreography of the customer. You, you know, it, it really is a journey, an emotional journey you need to take people on that builds sense of value. It doesn't happen all at once when you receive the product or you deliver the experience. You know, it happens. It's a process. Um, and I think that's often missed by brands. Chris, I'm fascinated by your entry into the world of trends, insight and forecasting. You started in fashion and since then, the Future Laboratory has diversified into all sorts of different sectors. What are the ones that particularly fascinate you at the moment? Well, interestingly, and I'm, I'm not just saying this because it's obviously the topic of our, our podcast, but at the moment, it actually really is luxury because it is an area that we've spent a long time looking at in the future laboratory. It was over 15 years ago now that we first 
developed a, a piece of proprietary methodology for exploring how the luxury market is changing, which was our, our luxury lifestyle matrix, which we then called the, the life stage matrix. And we now call the life state matrix. So that shows how, to some extent, it, that's evolved and it's changed. Um, and, and there was a period, I think, for about 10 years, having developed throughout the 80s and into the 90s, I think luxury as an industry did slow down in its adaption of newness and it, and it became slightly slower in the way that it evolved and progressed. Whereas now I think luxury is absolutely at, at, a, at a transformational point in its journey, if you like, if in its own life stage. And so for me, luxury is actually one of the industry sectors that I'm finding hugely interesting. The others are to some extent, slightly more mundane, which is why I'm finding them quite interesting because there's sort of back of house issues like logistics and what's so deadlingly, boringly called human resources, but those kind of internal elements of how companies work, but which are, are two of the, the areas that I think are, are actually massively important for, for companies right now are probably my other two great concerns. I can't help but ask you about ChatGPT which I find fascinating. Um, but I'd love to get your general thoughts about it and its impact on business. Oh, look, I think it's going to be deeply profound. I mean, I, I remember speaking at a conference for Deloitte a few years back, and it was what they called their shared services conference, and which is where as a, you know, as a kind of business management tool and platform, they were talking about all those involved internal areas of a business. And you know, I sort of had to drop the bombshell that I was talking to a room full of people who, in my mind, were pretty much all going to be out of a job within a decade in a way that, you know, when I first started work in the 90s, people didn't really use email, but they did use word processors. And we'd just begun to see that shift away from the idea that businesses were staffed by these huge cohorts of predominantly female workers who were called secretaries and that you had things called typing pools. You, you, nobody has a typing pool anymore. We all type ourselves. And in, this, in the same way that the machine-based technology enables us all to, as it were, put secretaries out of a job, what ChatGBT is going to do is intelligently put solicitors and surveyors and all sorts of medium-level occupations out of a job but those jobs will just morph into something else as we begin to understand, for example, that it's no longer about the answer. It's about the question that you have to ask. You know, you know when I started the Future Laboratory, trends were still revered as something really quite sacred and special and people paid for them because we still didn't really understand how to use the internet and the search opportunities on the internet to find things out for ourselves. So my job was to bring the future to you because you didn't know where to look, you didn't know where it was, and there wasn't the mechanisms online to help collect and collate the information in the way that there is now. So we, our job was to share trends with you, was to go out and find them and then bring them to you. I don't have to do that anymore because everyone can do that themselves. So our role has changed. You know, We no longer, to some extent, share a vision of the future in the same way with our clients as we did 15 or 20 years ago. Our role is so much more strategic. It's about foresight. It's about helping you think about the decisions you need to make in order to make your own better future happen. So that change will continue with chat GPT, which is that I don't need to employ somebody in quite the same way to do that level of research that maybe I used to, but I'm still going to need an intelligent human being to help process just what this means at a human level for a client, for a business, and also for a future consumer. And I don't see any sign that chat GPT is, is necessarily pulling the strands or joining the dots in quite the same emotional or empathic or intuitive way that I and my team would. Um, Chris, actually, there's something you mentioned that I thought was interesting. You, you alluded to the disintermediation of like the middle of industries with, with AI. And what's the impact you think that will have on luxury? Look, I, as I said, I, I think luxury is actually about to go through or is already going through some really quite profound changes, because I think for the first time ever, really, we're beginning to unpick the actual definition of luxury and what it really means and its relevance to where we think luxury is going. So Luxury is a word 
comes from the Greek, the ancient Greek, and in essence, it originally meant or was defined by two ideas. One was of excess and the other was of wastefulness, which are obviously really quite uniquely combined. Um, and if you think about it, if you think about most of the, the, the kind of luxury product that we engage with, it has function at its heart, but the luxury benefit is purely artistic or is purely creative. So uh, a watch tells the time, but a, a luxury watch is just a timepiece that has more gold uh, or a different type of design or a more expensive strap on it. You know, it doesn't really matter whether my watch costs me £10 or £10,000. As long as it tells the time, it's performing the functional requirement of a watch. But the reason why we may choose to spend £10,000 on a watch has nothing to do with the fact that I need to know that it's 11.30 in the morning. You know, the embellishment of that timepiece, the expansion of the thinking around what it represents to me and to the creator at the maker, the emphasis on status and desirability and exclusivity and acquisition, the amount of time that's been spent to create it, all of these are factors that go to the heart of why human beings that are part of a civilized social structure, we choose to invest time and money in the consumption of objects, which is really a, a central part of the luxury question or the luxury journey. And yet here we are now, I think, as luxury consumers often really beginning to question whether my true engagement with luxury revolves around a notion of wastefulness and excess. And that's the challenge, I think, that we all now need to start to face and start to question, which is, do I still believe that at its heart, luxury should be defined by this notion of wastefulness and excess? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. It feels like luxury has moved from, you know, something that almost stands for wasteful opulence and into something that, you know, is much more focused on supply chain and provenance and those things really being a status symbol in their own right. I would agree with that. I mean, when we think about luxury, you know, words like craft, provenance, artisanship, you know, have defined tradition, have defined the luxury journey to some extent to date. And and that was very much the basis of the work uh, that we did over 15 years ago, looking at what we called, you know, our luxury life stage matrix, um, where we looked at these kind of five routes to luxury or these five journeys through luxury and they were in essence at that point defined by these often quite quite straightforward and quite traditional pillars and I think what we've noticed over the last 15 years is really how those have evolved and how those have changed in more recent years especially as I think we move into this decade which for us is all, is one all about transformation and it's all about journeys and it is about being part of a transformational world a transformational society an economy in transformation but also a human that's going through transformation, both individually, but also a collective level. And for us, the, the notion of a transformation economy of which luxury is a part is how increasingly brands and companies are having to understand that their consumer is going on this, this journey of self-actualization where the key things that they're looking for are the businesses, the brands, the products, the goods, the organizations that are going to help them on their journey to become healthier, wealthier and happier and I think those are the drivers that we see being the most critical. And they're not often about exclusivity, aspiration and status. And, and so I think when we really start to judge the success of luxury now, as opposed to, say, 1985 or 1995 or 2005 or 2015, I think we can see over the last 10 years some very different strands and stories beginning to emerge. How have you seen the, the, the customer change, the, the discerning customer in inverted commas? Well, a great point. I mean, if, if we go back to that, that kind of mid-1980s date, which I'm using very roughly here, but if you look at the kind of the history, for example, of the designer catwalk, it was in the early to mid-1980s that we saw the Chambre Syndicale in Paris, the defining council that decided who could be allowed to be part of 
the designer fashion collection system that we saw Ray Kawakubo from Comme des Garçons being allowed to, to show on the catwalk. And that was a defining moment where we suddenly saw catwalk move from being this group of very small French-led and Italian companies that were defined as being part of the world of, of catwalk fashion that sat adjacent to haute couture, where we, where we saw this, this growth of you know, the off-the-peg, ready-to-wear collections. And, and with that, of course, we saw the growth of the, the luxury beer moths that we now had. We had that first round of purchasing from Bernard Arnault as he started to form his luxury goods conglomerate, um, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. We saw the emergence of the first iteration of what is now the Caring Group, which previously was the Gucci Group, which, of course, uh, previously was Pino's uh, collection of businesses that came out of his uh, his catalog business and uh, from from Pranton, the department store in La Redoute. And it was that first kind of those first iterative steps into that that idea of taking what had previously been for a very, very small group of people in certain, uh, you know, very specific regions of a town or a city like in Paris, you know, the 16th or, you know, kind of Fifth Avenue and Madison in New York or Beecham Place, um, you know, and Bond Street in, in London. And, and you had this idea that it was rarefied. It was bourgeois. And, and you knew who your client was because they would invariably walk into your store dressed in your clothes. And they all looked in a similar way. And it was very much that people like us mentality. And it was about these small, highly circumscribed and highly defined groups of people. And, you know, what we saw, of course, in the 80s was an explosion of wealth, an explosion of, of money and a growth of new money that challenged the old order that was about the idea that suddenly everyone should be welcome, which, of course, was one. If you move on a decade and you continue the story, you see how when Tom Ford, for example, took over the reins at Gucci, he democratized this idea of fashion, threw open the doors of the Gucci stores and kind of said, we want everyone to feel welcome. It doesn't matter whether you're walking in a, in a pair of trainers. We didn't call them sneakers then. If you're coming in in a pair of trainers and a baseball cap, we want to make you feel as equally welcome as somebody who's turning up in a Rolls Royce um, and um, a suit. And of course, this threw the luxury businesses into a bit of a quandary because it wasn't so easy for them to recognize who actually had the bigger wallet and who they should be spending their time with. But we very quickly saw that ability to to change our service models, to, to rethink our collections. And of course, what we've seen from the moment when Stephen Sprouse first scrawled all over a Louis Vuitton handbag was this idea that we were suddenly looking at all sorts of new inspirations. I, I mentioned before the idea of grunge, the idea of graffiti, the idea of skate, the idea of street, the idea of hip hop, of emergent black cultures that previously had had no influence on uh, luxury or on designer wear whatsoever. But we we allowed all of these new and diverse um, uh, creative uh, universes to really rejuvenate what had become a very moribund and very kind of self-serving and very insular uh, industry. And of course, that's where we all loved it. And very quickly, the businessmen who sat behind these recognized that this was all about selling product. And it wasn't actually about selling the high ticket items that our previous luxury consumers had bought. It was about selling uh, credit card holders and belts and sunglasses and key rings and basically tchotchkes that sat under 500 bucks, even on, sat under 200 bucks. But these little things that all of us could feel gave us a little part of that, that Louis Vuitton lifestyle, that, that Gucci moment. And that, of course, was the, was the journey into democratization that we saw throughout the 90s and into the noughts. And, and, and that takes us now back into a state where, of course, we've now seen Chanel increase the price of its standard black padded and chain handbag by 30 percent over the last three years. We've seen stores like Balenciaga and Chanel now change their policy so that, for example, they now have hidden and exclusive stores again where the doors are most definitely closed to you and me because we're we're not their ideal client. We're not going to be spending enough. We are not a VIC, a very important client. And we're moving back into the realms of exclusivity, but also the understanding that throughout the decades that I've been describing, we have seen the unparalleled growth of a new class of ultra high net worth individuals who can afford to spend 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 
thousand pounds on particular items and products or invest that much on a yearly or seasonal basis with a brand and 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 so it's all been about the upward spiral of price and the upward spiral of engagement and so the trajectory of luxury i think has been singularly engaging and interesting but i think we now sit at a an inflection point i was very interested in a piece that the new york times wrote recently on the, the whole idea of deep fakes and how you know the kind of fakes that we used to pick up on canal street are now very very different and that we have fakes coming out of China and out of other markets that are indistinguishable from the products that I would buy from Fendi or from Dior in store. And that we now have obviously businesses like The Real Real who invest, you know, thousands of pounds in identification and verification of product. But what interests me is not the notion of the parallel market or the fake market, is the fact that I think we now have a group of consumers who simply don't care and don't actually see the value in knowing that what they've got in their hands is a real Dior or a real Fendi as opposed to a copycat piece. And that's part of the shift, which is that it's no longer simply about a badge of aspiration that shows that I wish I was part of this world that I maybe could never really afford to be part of. It's actually that I'm just buying a piece of something I like but my relationship with that brand is entirely promiscuous and really has no loyalty. And this is where I think the changes in corporate structure, in company structure, in the whole kind of catalogue of new brands that we have coming out that talk to our younger consumers in different ways is where we start to see a reevaluation of, of market and of uh, opportunity. Can you talk uh, the listeners through your process? How, how do you go about assimilating the research and information required to, to forecast and, and deliver insights? There, there are a number of different kind of methodologies and processes that we use. And the, the first, I think, is very much as a response to both Martin and my own training and background, which, as I said, was in fashion. And it was very much, if you look back to, to the early days of the 80s and the 90s, they were forecasting companies. So as fashion had moved into this seasonal model of, deliver, of delivery, it, which was faster than any other business sector at that time in terms of having to almost reinvent themselves every two or, or four times a year with new collections, no other product category was moving that fast. The fashion industry already had support businesses that were there to help them, color predictors, you know, trend predictors, um, agencies that were helping them to, to really assess and collate and then to have a better understanding of of, of maybe where they should move in terms of color, uh, uh, silhouette, uh, design, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that kind of shift in terms of movement was something that we spotted. And then as we saw, as I've said, the late 80s and the 90s start to really impact on the more rarefied designer end of fashion. And we started to, to see the impact of street and of hip hop culture and of um, uh, uh, um, athleisure uh, really start to take hold as a category. Um, we started to look and sense what was going on around us from a whole new set of influences. And we did what P P Faith Popcorn, the, the American futurologist, calls brailing culture. We were sensorially engaging with the world around us. And we were doing something very important, which we defined as cultural triangulation, which was that we were taking a reading on what was going on around us in order that we could actually start to see and map a, a, a journey into the future. And just as when you read a map, you would take three coordinates to then work out your fourth coordinate, your trajectory into the future. We looked at that geographic kind of activity and applied it in a cultural sense as a metaphor. So we talked about the, our three points of reference being intuition, observation and interrogation. So intuition sits at the heart of what we do at the Future Laboratory, which is if we're not out, if we're not seeing, if we're not out sensing and experiencing, we are not feeling culture. And that's the really important thing. So we are constantly intuiting, sensing what's going on around us. It, it, it's one thing sensing it as an individual and then trying to explain that to a client and saying, OK, you know, right, we're going to tell you, uh, I know you've been really successful with pink over the last couple of years, but next season's all about blue. So we want you to stop doing pink and, and do blue because we sense that blue is going to be big. How does a business that has a multi-million pound turnover 
pivot around somebody who is just sensing that they're seeing blue and that blue is important. So how you interrogate and observe blue and the growth of blue is hugely important. And the process by which you do that is incredibly important. And to that, we turn to the science that sits behind what we do, which in sociological terms, it really looks at how trends grow. And this is the work around the notion of trend has been growing since the since the post-war period, really, since the late 50s and 60s. And in fact, for us, one of the kind of seminal works around this is a book called The Diffusion of Innovations, which was written by Everett M. Rogers, the American professor from the University of Iowa back in 1962, who really defined the findings of other sociologists who were studying small groups of often isolated consumers or, or people in communities and to observe what happens when you drop newness into that community. So, for example the work of Bryce Ryan and Neil uh, Gross, who were two sociologists who were looking at small remote communities of, of, of wheat farmers in the American Midwest. And what they'd do is they'd watch what happened when um, a new piece of uh, farm machinery or a new seed type was introduced into that community. And they'd look at the rate of adoption. You know, you drop something new in, how quickly do people respond to newness? The diffusion of innovation. And that curve, the S-curve, which defines the rate of adoption, is what most trend forecasters do in order to understand change. Because what you see is how a tiny percentage of a population, only literally about 2.5% of people, are actually innovating, are coming up with something new. But behind them is a group of really important people that are called or classified early adopters, of which in most given Uh, societies. And of course, what sociologists have done in the period since 1962 have studied this phenomenon and have begun to actually see how there are constants in any given community and even any society around the world is how our early adopters are the people who run towards newness. They are attracted by newness. In fact, they define their status by their ability to tell you that they've come across something before you have. They're those slightly sickeningly annoying people who have read that book before you heard that piece of music before you, tried that restaurant, had their haircut change, bought a new pair of uh, sneakers or, or found a new designer before you. They love newness. And, and what they're very good at is transmitting that newness to other people and sharing it with the two major groups that then follow our early majority and late majority. That's our mainstream consumer. But they, in the early majority, only tend to jump when there's a sense of safety in numbers. So they they look at what the early uh, adopter is doing, and normally the first time they see it, they they kind of laugh in disbelief that you've kind of wearing those jeans or you cut your hair like that. The second time, they, they kind of are normally quite rude about it. And then the third time, they're doing it themselves. So there's this process of that journey into acceptance and then engagement. And, and that curve is where we get the phrase to be ahead of the curve. And so our role as a business is to spend our time watching, looking and living with that small group of people who are ahead of the curve. And if you think about the great American writer and thinker, William Gibson, you know, he came out with that classic quote, which again was so instrumental for us at the Future Laboratory. The future has already happened. It just isn't very well distributed. In other words, the future is already here. It's already happening. You just need to know where to look. And of course, if you look at um, something as profoundly impactful over the last 10 years or 15 years of culture as, say, the hipster movement that has changed our relationship forever with avocados and fixed wheel bikes and tattoos and sourdough bread and uh, coffee and 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 microbreweries, just to name a few kind of areas of, of kind of kind of focus, all of those were elements that were were integral in the development of hipster lifestyle and the hipster movement. And you didn't see that in Soho, really, uh, in London. You didn't see that in, um, certainly not in Beach and Place or in Madison Avenue. You had to go to Brooklyn. You had to go to Williamsburg. You had to go to Hoxton. You had to go to Shoreditch. You had to go to these different parts of town where the future was already happening. And that's the journey that we take our clients on. We'll show you the future and help you to determine its relevancy by interrogating it and asking questions and watching it to find out whether this is something that is just going to be ahead of the curve, to use a colloquial expression, or a flash in the pan 
to use another, you know, because that's what everyone wants to know. What's the impact on the mainstream? Because that's where the money sits. Chris, what what does the 20s represent to you so far? The, the, the 1920s, they're fondly known as the Roaring Twenties. What do you think will define this decade? Oh, that's such a great question. Well, interestingly, of course, there are some economists who are already predicting that we're going to experience an economic depression uh, uh, and a crash as big as the 1927 Great Depression that was in the US and then obviously influenced the rest of the world. But for me, I'm actually pretty much a glass half full kind of guy rather than a glass half empty. So I, I, I tend to want to be really positive about how we're going to deal with all of the problems that will increasingly impact on us over this, this difficult decade. And so we talk about a lot at the Future Laboratory about the transformation economy and what we call the transformative 20s. So for us, this is, is a decade of enormous change, of quite profound change, of continual change. But it is about this journey of trans, of transformation of the, the um, sometimes beautiful, sometimes dirty, bloody, sticky, messy journey that I think we're going to go through as we transform into w the next great iteration of, of how society develops and changes, which, of course, will be forced upon us if we don't do it quick enough ourselves. And, and what us sits at the heart of this is a number of things. Obviously, technology is a driving force behind this, which will continually question, you know, what it is we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing and the value that we get out of it. As more and more of the things that we thought were all about defined being human can be done by machines, then what is it that is unique to humanity that we can only do ourselves? That becomes a critical question that we have to ask ourselves. We, of course, have to embrace uh, the r limited capacity and resources of the planet that we live on and that we are damaging. And so we we face that head on um, through a climate crisis. A and we also think about the, the impact of all the other problems that we've already created for ourselves, whether that be around economic migration, difference and diversity, and creating worlds of equity and opportunity. So for, for us, a lot of these start to coalesce around this notion of transformation and particularly around what we've called neo-collectivism, that one of the big shifts that we see is the move from a me to we culture. So much of what is involved in consumption is this focus on me. You know, this is for me. I do it for me. And often we mistake individuality, individualism and personalization around the cult of me. But I think one of the journeys that will go on in this next decade is a greater focus back on we culture, on community, on, on collectivism. And in fact, for us, the transformation economy is about the alignment between the individual, the citizen, the consumer, and the businesses and the brands with their products and goods and services that help them proactively on their journey towards becoming healthier, wealthier, and happier. That, you know, this idea that we are actually moving from a society based on hedonism to one that focuses on eudynomics or eudaimonism, which is, a, a, again, a bit like uh, hedonomics as is a, is a Greek uh, term to define the idea that we get pleasure not in uh, a selfish engagement with sensorial acts that satisfy or sate our senses, hedonism, but w that we actually derive pleasure from selfless or mindful acts that benefit and perpetuate the good of society. We don't stop consuming. We don't stop spending money on things. It's just what we spend our money on really begins to change. Chris, uh, we ask all of our guests uh, a couple of questions every time. And the first one I want to ask is, what irritates you the most about your industry? Do you know what? Funnily enough, I was seeing a client today and um, they've got a new creative director who's come in from a, a similar to the journey I made from an editorial perspective. They were uh, pretty high up the editor of a, a fashion magazine and are now in a, a, a retail business. And I think we were both decrying the fact that so much of our industry is still dominated by some pretty toxic working environments because we still, I think, have a really, really negative way of of handling talent, handling ego. And it really shocks me to actually see how some people who I think behave incredibly badly and create really nasty working environments continue to succeed 
in a way that I don't believe they should. And I think, and I do believe one of the opportunities that chat GBT and AI is going to do is to actually not democratize creativity. That's not what I'm interested in, but it's actually going to knock the idea of the the star designer uh, of their pillar. And I'd be very happy to see that. I think at times that, that can actually create quite toxic environments where opinions based on opinions. Yes. Uh, Chris, what most concerns you about the world we're leaving the next generation? Oh, uh, well, I mean, there are a number of things. Look, all the statistics are showing that, you know, the, 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 the average quality of life that most younger people are going to have is not going to be as high as that of their parents. I, that I find astounding that given everything that we set out to achieve as progressive, joined up, intelligent societies based on capitalist models has singularly failed to actually deliver um, a, a broader and better quality of life to the next generation. Um, you, you know, that for me just just shows us that, that, that some things aren't right, that some things really aren't working. So that for me, I think, is is probably the one thing that I found astounding absolutely astounding yeah without a doubt <laughs> um chris if you had to give out your job tomorrow what would you do hopefully i'm i am still going to be in the job <laughs> for a while i've got no intention to give up doing what i do i, I i'm either eminently employable or or deeply unemployable I, and i'm not quite sure in which camp i sit i think i would very much welcome actually um if i didn't have to be so focused on a, an income or a salary um, is actually something that was really, really people focused and that was about constant human interaction with strangers, you know, working in a restaurant, kind of, you know, in some ways jobs that you kind of think you'd never go back to, which we've probably all done and which for me was, uh, you know, a hugely important life lesson, you know, waiting on tables. But I think to be able to recognize uh, the unfolding of human drama as people are uh, having really important moments in a, in a restaurant, for example, I I would I'd find that really fascinating. So maybe I would opt for uh, being a maitre d' in a restaurant. That's a great one. My last question is: What is the most exciting thing for you in the next five years? And I couldn't think of someone in a better industry to ask that question of. There are so many things that I could talk about. I mean, I suppose okay for me, it's it's actually about the redefinition of structure and of business structure. So I'm fascinated at the moment by. DAOs. Uh, uh, hopefully, all, all of our listeners have come across this uh, this acronym already. And I think this idea of how we begin to see new disintermediated um, autonomous organisations start to come to the fore, uh, I think where we see structural change in terms of old-fashioned hierarchical businesses that were defined by human need, human greed, um, st instead look at self-serving structures that really attack a problem and, and think about what's good for the whole, I think is really, really interesting. So for me, that fits in very neatly with some thinking that we did a while back at the Future Laboratory, which we've now has coalesced around this idea of what we call becoming an, a, an O2O business. So we know what a, a B2B business is and we know what a B2C business is, but what about an O2O, and that's an owner-to-owner -owner model. And that's really defined by the idea that we are all actually increasingly buyers and sellers. And so we're all part of a broker generation where we all own something that has a value and that can be sold. And so the moment that we start creating equity around um, this relationship around what we own and what we buy and what we sell, I think starts to have a fundamental impact on the very structure of, of the process of of commerce, of commerciality, and then also of consumption. And I think we start to maybe value it different and we'll see massive shifts in our value chains. So I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in this idea and excited by this idea of, of when we start to really leave behind the old structures of 20th century thinking and 20th century business engineering and really start to embrace 21st century models and i think that is absolutely going to happen over the next five to ten years fascinating that was really really interesting thank you so much chris for your time oh it's been a pleasure anand thank you so much thanks so much for listening this has been what the lux 
You can find us on socials at Matter of Fawn and drop us any questions or comments on Twitter using the hashtag WhatTheLux. And if you're a luxury brand looking for strategy or design that goes beyond the banal, get in touch via hello at matcherform.com and chat to one of our consultants. And so, until next time.